Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Indonesians come together for a rare Passover celebration. Palestinian and Israeli leaders trade barbs at the United Nations and will reveal how Israelis are helping earthquake victims in Ecuador. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here with the latest news in Israel. Jewish people around the world mark the beginning of Passover on Friday night, even in Muslim-majority Indonesia. The Southeast Asian country does not recognize Judaism as an official religion. Yet in an unlikely turn of events, nearly 50 people came together to celebrate Passover in the name of peace and harmony. Indonesia is a Muslim-majority country where every citizen's religion is marked on their identity card. The country recognizes six religions officially. Islam, Catholicism, Protestantism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Confucianism. Judaism doesn't happen to be one of them. So the fact that almost 50 people gathered to celebrate Passover in the Indonesian capital is a pretty big deal. Men and women of different faiths gathered to celebrate an ancient Jewish tradition here in a Muslim-majority country is a very powerful thing. Most of the Jews in Indonesia are descendants of Dutch or Iraqi immigrants who came to the country in the 1920s. And there are less than 200 believers currently living in the nation. The majority of the Jewish people in Indonesia have to hide their religious identity. And they're usually identified as Christian on their Indonesian ID cards. Indonesia is the world's biggest Muslim nation. And anti-Semitism is reportedly very high, which has forced many Jews to practice their faith underground. Indonesian Jews hope that that will one day change. Kita sangat berharap supaya pemerintah bisa uh, melihat ini merupakan bagian yang perlu juga mendapat hak yang sama dengan yang lain. Jadi kita harus punya sama-sama karena memang ya itulah identitas kita harus beragam. Kita bersatu dalam keberagaman ya termasuk agama karena kepercayaan itu kan hak seseorang. Jadi dia mau berhubungan dengan Tuhannya seperti apa. Indonesia's last synagogue was demolished in 2013 after being closed off by Islamic hardliners. Until today, it's unclear who was ultimately responsible for destroying it. Some claim the violence comes from a misunderstanding of Judaism in Indonesia, especially since regular Indonesians have very limited interactions with Jewish people. When they say, I hate Jews, I hate Israel, you can't really, you can't really judge them because they don't actually have met any Jews at all. Many of Indonesia, the vast majority, have not. This year wasn't the first time that Jews gathered to celebrate Passover. Yet it was the first time that Muslim clerics broke Jewish matzah bread with Jews in the Passover blessing ceremony. The United States Deputy Secretary of State Antony Blinken even attended the powerful event. Religious leaders say the Passover Seder was a special way to promote peace and harmony among religions, and that they hope the message will continue on. Itu agama apapun di dunia itu menginginkan adanya perdamaian perdamaian dunia dan itu sudah terdapat di dalam pembukaan undang-undang dasar 45 bahwa sesungguhnya kemerdekaan itu ialah hak segala bangsa oleh sebab itu penjajahan dalam bentuk apapun hendaknya kita hindari If the thousands of Jews visiting Jerusalem for Passover haven't been enough to liven up the atmosphere, today also marks Palm Sunday for Orthodox Christians. Hundreds are attending a procession in Jerusalem to mark the beginning of the Easter week festivities. Pilgrims from around the world gathered at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to mark the beginning of Easter week festivities. Western Christians held the holiday last month, but followers of the Orthodox Church go by a different calendar. According to Christian tradition, Palm Sunday marks a date where Jesus entered Jerusalem just before his arrest and crucifixion, when his followers strewed palm branches in his path. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is believed to be the site of his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. World leaders came together on Friday for the United Nations Climate Summit. While the event was supposed to be a demonstration of global unity to save the environment, it ended up as another platform for Palestinian and Israeli leaders to take aim at one another. The Palestinian president took advantage of the international gathering to criticize Israel. But Israel's ambassador to the UN was quick to hit back. Over 60 world leaders joined on Friday during a signing ceremony for the Paris Climate Accord and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas took to the stage to attack Israel. 
هو الذي يدمر المناخ في فلسطين وإن الاستيطان الإسرائيلي هو الذي يدمر الطبيعة في فلسطين نرجوكم أن تساعدونا على إنهاء الاحتلال وإنهاء الاستيطان Abbas's verbal attack is just the latest example of continuing Israeli-Palestinian tensions. The Israeli ambassador to the UN, Danny Danan, responded sharply when it was his turn to address the UN ceremony, where 175 nations signed the Paris Accord. Mr. President, this climate summit is supposed to be a demonstration of global unity for the sake of the future of our planet, of our children. Unfortunately, President Abbas exploited this international respectable stage to spread hatred again against Israel. Instead of misleading the international community here in the UN, President Abbas should act to stop Palestinian terror. The Palestinian president's attendance at the climate ceremony is one of great symbolic importance, given the United Nations' recent de facto recognition of Palestine. Since 2012, the UN has considered Palestine a non-member observer state. Friday's Global Climate Summit happens to be the first time a Palestinian president sat in the General Assembly Hall as a state party. Palestine's participation in the event could lead to complications for the United States, which isn't allowed to give money to any funds with organizations that are not officially recognized as a state. In other words, the U.S. may not be able to donate to the Global Climate Fund because of Palestinian involvement. Israel is known as a startup nation, so it's safe to say the Jewish state understands how important it is to have a good knowledge of technology. Now, one Israeli organization is on a mission to provide underprivileged people with even more access to tech. Didi Ben Shalom joins us from Machshavat Tova with more. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about your organization. Well, Machshavat Tova, meaning good thought in English, was established in Jerusalem in 2004. Our chair uh, worked in a high-tech company, and he saw a lot of teens sort of walking around the street with nothing valuable to do with their lives. And at that time, it was uh, very uncommon for people to have computers in their homes, especially in underprivileged neighborhoods. So he said, I'm going to start this computer course. And he opened a little class, and he always tells how the day after he opened the class. Kids were already knocking on the door and asking to come in and use the computer, and it was very, very exciting. And then their parents came, and their grandparents came, and everyone in the community become, became very involved in those classes. And that's how we started opening our computer classes all around the country. And so, you know, obviously, knowing how to use a computer is a huge, important part of day-to-day -day life now. How do you make that clear to the people that you're working with who, you know, think that otherwise that they'd rather write or, or they don't feel that technology is maybe necessary? It's, it almost doesn't happen anymore. People know that if they want to move forward with their lives, if it's education, if it's becoming a part of their community, if it's uh, getting better jobs, they know that the computer is part of that process. It doesn't necessarily have to be high tech. It can also be very low tech, but even if you're running a store, you need to use a computer. So we don't even have to convince anyone anymore. They really come to us. Right, because initially people were kind of scared of how, learning how to use the uh, internet and learning how to use computers, but that's changing now. So what locations do you work in? What kind of populations are you helping? Well, today we work all around the country after leaving Jerusalem and, and moving all over the place. And we work with pretty much everyone in Israel. We work with Arabs, we work with Orthodox Jews, we work with youth at risk, we, we work with Olim Chadashim, we work with uh, kids and people with disabilities. And for every population, we try and create a program that answers their need. So if someone has a disability that makes it hard for him to leave the house, it can be very helpful for him to be exposed to social media so he can make friends and be more in touch with his family. And also how to buy things on the internet and have someone bring them home for him can be something that really changes his life and makes it easier. And if a child is almost dropping out of school, giving him a program that will help him stay with his peers is also something that can really make a change in their lives. So we work with every population and we create programs that are suitable for them. So can you tell us a story about you know, how your organization has helped a specific family or individual? Uh, it's hard. There are so many stories. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, um, we had uh, one of the courses for youth at risk end. And uh, one of the mothers came up to me, sort of very, very excited and, and shy, and she said, listen, 
I really don't have any skills in computers, so, so I can't teach in your organization, but I really want to volunteer in some way because the change that you've made in my son's life is something that I want to help you keep giving to the world. So for me, that was very exciting. Yeah, I can only imagine. So now, you know, if you're interested in volunteering, or I, this is a nonprofit that we're talking about, so obviously, obviously we want to hear how you're, how you're funding this. Mm -hmm. How can we get involved? Uh, well, we work with a lot of high-tech companies that really cooperate with us with knowledge or funds or even having programs uh, in-house in their organizations. And of course, we have very kind donors from all around uh, the world that help us in achieving this goal. Great. Well, again, thank you so much for coming in. It's uh, great to see what you guys are doing. Thank you so much. The Israeli organization Israel Aid has set up a field hospital in Ecuador to help the survivors of last week's devastating earthquake, which killed over 600 Ecuadorians. The 7.8 magnitude quake is the worst natural disaster that Ecuador has seen in the last decade, but Israel Aid has already found a way to help out by providing emergency medical treatment in the hard-hit town of Kanoa. Israel Aid arrived in Ecuador several days ago and has been using private planes to reach the areas worst hit by the earthquake. Since most of the land infrastructure in Kanoa has been destroyed, thousands of people have been left without any health care options. Israel Aid started operating a makeshift field hospital in the town on Saturday evening, and the team will focus on providing emergency medical treatment, psychosocial care, and child-friendly spaces for the victims. 98% of the buildings in Kanoa were destroyed, and many Ecuadorians are sleeping outside and struggling to find food and water. Ecuador now faces a long and costly reconstruction effort that will probably cost billions of dollars. But the country was already facing economic hardships because of the collapse in world oil prices. Rescuers are continuing to comb through the rubble in the coastal towns most affected by the quake. But the clock is running out when it comes to finding survivors. Disaster management workers say a person without serious injuries can only survive up to a week buried under debris in the Ecuadorian heat. It might seem like conventional wisdom that Yiddish began as an offshoot of the German language. But now new DNA analysis technology shows that the historic language of the Ashkenazi Jews may have originated from a totally different place. And you won't believe where. A study led by the Israeli-born researcher Dr. Eran el Chayik claims that Yiddish actually originates from northeastern Turkey. The research shows that Yiddish may have been invented by Iranian and Slavic Jews, who traded on the Silk Road around the 9th century. To back up the claim even further, many of those Jews apparently came from four ancient Turkish villages along the Silk Route that all happened to have names similar to Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz, Eskenaz, Ashans, and Ashkuz. This has led researchers to surmise that Jewish merchants on the route invented the secret language in order to keep their monopoly on the profitable silk trade. So how did Yiddish make it to Central Europe? The study suggests that as Jews then spread throughout Europe, the language acquired words from other languages, mainly German. If you're wondering how Dr. Iran el Chayek did his research, he apparently identified 367 people who claim they have two parents who are Ashkenazi Jews. He then used GPS algorithms to analyze a participant's DNA and predict their geographical origins. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. We don't know about you, but our Passover began with a lot of food and a lot more wine. So today's word is yain, which means wine in Hebrew. If you're not a big fan of the bitter drink, don't worry. In Israel, you have lots of options to get through the holidays. From sweet Manashevitz yain to good old grape juice, there are tons of fruity beverages to toast to. Wine has long been known as a biblical beverage for both Jews and Christians. Israelis like to say, Nichnas yain yatsa sod, or once wine enters, your secrets come out. If you've ever sat through a four-hour Seder, just listen to Grandma speak. You might find that saying to be true. So I guess this is the bottom line. During a long evening of yain tasting with friends, keep your ears open. You might hear something so interesting that you'll have a story to tell for years to come. Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. It's the beginning of a new week, and as the Passover festivities continue, the weather is getting warmer. Monday is expected to be mostly sunny with a high of 79. Tuesday should be even hotter with the temperature going up all the way to 88 degrees. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.77 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to check out our evening update every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you tonight.